Welcome to a thought-provoking and educational episode of The Municipal Affairs. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we are embarking on a journey through the picturesque landscapes of Alberta's summer villages. And then our special guest for today's episode is none other than the president of the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta, Councillor Mike Pashik. In this one-on-one interview, President Pashik and I delve deep into the heart of the matters of utmost importance to the summer villages nestled within the breathtaking province of Alberta. Together, we navigate through the past, the present, and future of these 51 unique member communities. Join us as we explore the fascinating transformation of summer villages over the last century, a journey marked by growth, change, and an unwavering commitment to preserving the natural beauty that graces this province. And as the calendar flips into October, anticipation is building for the 65th Annual Conference of the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta, scheduled for October 19th and 20th in Edmonton. President Pashik shares his insights into the objectives and aspirations that the association hopes to achieve during this pivotal gathering, a beacon of collaboration and progress for the summer villages across Alberta. So fasten your seatbelts as we embark on a captivating voyage into the world of Alberta's summer villages, a world filled with community, nature, and a promising future. Stay tuned as we sit down with the president and unravel the essence of this enchanting landscape of Alberta summer villages. This is the Municipal Affairs. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking about summer villages in the province of Alberta. Now, before we get into sort of the issues and the state of summer villages in the province, I I, I kind of got to start with a sort of an educational question here. Can you explain to me, like I'm a two-year-old toddler, what is a summer village and how does it differ if it does from any other type of municipality in the province of Alberta? Oh, that's a, that's a good start. <laughs> um, uh you know, I think what you'll hear from me today is that perhaps the term summer village maybe shouldn't apply anymore. And and I'll start by saying, you know, summer villages are a municipality within Alberta. We're governed by the Municipal Government Act, just like everybody else. We have CAOs, we have staff, we've got issues, we've got capital projects. Uh, just the same as every other uh, municipality in Alberta. And, but there are pro- maybe two uh, differences for us. When we were formed, allowed to form, it wasn't based on population. It was based on the number of homes in the community. Being uh, back way back in the day, uh, it was all seasonal, so they counted homes instead of people. And so that's a little bit different. And then the other thing that the government has allowed us to do, because we are, in their mind, seasonal, um, is that we have our voting days on a different schedule than other municipalities. Where other municipalities hold them in October, we hold them in the summer months when uh, generally we have the best turnout and residents are in using their uh, summer homes. So um, not a lot different. So you are 65 years old as of October of this year. Um, I I know summer villages have gone through a massive change over the last, well, let's say 65 years because you're 65 years young now. Um, can, Can you talk me through the progression of, that very first summer village to uh, where we are now, uh, because I, I can imagine that the very first summer village, like you said, was uh, predicated on homes and not people. Uh, and now you are fully autonomous sort of municipalities within the province of Alberta, correct? Oh, that's, that's correct. Uh, it's been a, a real change. Um, and you, you know, you can go back to 1913 of all things, and and our our first summer village on Gull Lake, uh, 
uh, got recognized as a summer village. And it was about 1918, they finally changed what was the Municipal Government Act at the time to incorporate summer villages into all the rules uh, in Alberta. And then over the years, you know, a few came on and I'd say the greatest change for for us as uh, summer villages came, you know, in that 1950s to 1970s era where um, municipal districts and counties were figuring out, you know, where their tax base was, what services they should provide to uh, the residents, rural residents. And um, uh, our lakeside communities, you know, we're looking for an opportunity to self-govern, to set direction for themselves. And they were a little bit disappointed in the tax rates and the lack of service from our rural uh, neighbors. To, and, and so uh, lots joined in in that, that period. And, uh, you know, it was actually 1958 when this association got started. And it was really, it's, a, it's kind of a, a, a fun story in that in 1957, they were changing the way infrastructure grants or su sustainability grants were provided to municipalities. And summer villages were on the raw end of the deal. And there was a few folks uh, that decided they should do something about it and, and had some connections in government. So in they go to Edmonton, uh, meet up with the ministers of the day and, and tell their story on why they should be getting money and more money uh, because we're sustainable uh, uh, villages or communities. And of course, they, they doubled their infrastructure grant from that little bit of advocacy work. And so uh, the next year, all the summer villages got together and there was only probably about 21 at the time uh, and, and said, look, you know, if we have that kind of su success with just a couple of voices, imagine how strong we could be if we all joined together and, and worked as one, had a common voice on certain issues. And here the association of summer villages was, was formed 65 years ago. What the fun part of the story is, is here we are 65 years later, still advocating for infrastructure grants. <laughs> and, and it's the same storyline. You know, we're, we feel that we're on the wrong end of the uh, uh, stick uh, for infrastructure grants. And, and it's been kind of my passion for the last four years, uh, advocating for change. But um, today, the thing I'd say about summer villages, you know, they're no longer that that seasonal recreational cottage uh, that's operating for only a small portion of the year, like back in 1913. Today, summer villages are vibrant communities. They um, have many permanent residents living there year round. And what we also see is that many of those part-time residents use their summer village home year round. You like in my community on a winter weekend, you know, probably half the homes out here are full of people and they're enjoying the lake, they're snowmobiling, they're ice fishing, you know, all those sorts of things that you do. So it it really is a year round um, community uh, nowadays. So just a quick, quick, quick follow up on that sort of statement that you just made there. You kept on saying the word lakeside. Are are summer villages in the province of Alberta traditionally villages, aka summer villages, on a lake or near a body of water? Is that a traditional uh, stereotype of summer villages? Because uh, I've been trying to do my research, and you say uh, you said twenty one at the time when the association was formed. I'm like. I think I got to 10 before I went. They seem to be all on lakes. So oh, are, yeah. are, are summer villages traditionally found on lakeside uh, lakesides in the province? Absolutely. There's there's a uh, a body of water that uh, people gravitated to for recreational purposes. And they started building cabins. Now we see year-round homes and everything. But 
Absolutely. I, I think, uh, well, I know, uh, out of our summer villages, there's only one that's on a river. The rest are all on a lake uh, in various parts of the province. Now, I, I, I want to get into the crux of the interview, and I want to talk about sort of the issues that summer villages are facing right now. And I, I guess I got to start with the big one. Um we are seeing uh, a lot of issues across this country right now with the cr- cost of affordability, with the housing crisis. Are are they similar issues that are affecting the summer villages in Alberta, or are you seeing different issues? And what is the current state of summer villages in the province? Well, um, uh, there, I, there's a couple of things. You know, I don't think we're seeing the same Uh, housing pressures. Summer villages tend to be fully developed already and there's not a lot of expansion that will or growth that will happen inside the summer villages. The you know um, back back in 1995 the government decided uh, that summer villages shouldn't be formed anymore and and so um, the ability to form a new summer villages was removed from the municipal government act back then and you know, perhaps through some great lobbying efforts by our our rural partners. Um, But either way, uh, so there are 51 of us left over and and we continue to be viable, sustainable uh, communities. And I, I would say the issue isn't so much a housing issue that we find, it's the cost for providing services. And so you can imagine just like in the inner core of a large center where somebody that's been there for 60 years uh, and, and the services have increased, the cost to provide services have increased. And now that, that uh, uh, aging population is struggling, you know, to, to pay for property taxes and things like that. That's a real struggle for summer villages and, and something that, my council, all of our councils are are very cognizant uh, about and, and and trying to keep our costs low but provide the right service. So the million dollar follow up to that question then, Mike, is how do you do that? Um, with the cost going through the roof and your tax base being so small, and I and I mean that respectfully because you know and I know that you don't have a large population like a Calgary or even a Brooks or even a Tofield. You're a small uh, summer village and traditionally uh, municipalities, including summer villages, rely on tax bases and grants to do uh, services. How does yeah. How does the path forward look for summer villages with understanding that the financial constraints that they're under isn't a viable path forward, or is it? Yeah, no, uh, great question. I'll, 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 the one thing that I'd say about summer village, villages is they're very good, very financially responsible. And, and the um, examples I would give, so there's 51 summer villages. There are a number of summer villages that go together to hire a single CAO and staff. And so like on Sylvan Lake here, five summer villages, one CAO, one set of staff services, all five summer villages. So we've come together as a group and said, here's how we keep our costs low. We're gonna share share some staff. We're we're going to look for our our best contracts. and, and then the, the next thing we have is that we look to our rural partners and contract services back from them. So maybe fire, uh, um, library services, uh, things like that, garbage services. And, and so we keep our costs low and, and we actually add benefit to maybe the, the town or the county that's surrounding us by providing some additional revenue for them. So we're offsetting some of their costs. So there's this joint desire to control costs. And um, I I guess another great example would be around Sylvan Lake and many uh, of the lakes and and summer villages do this, but 
this one's near and dear to me, is that the eight different municipalities around this lake all got together and came up with uh, a Sylvan Lake intermunicipal development plan, something which is a strong formal document that looks to protect the, the lake, defines how we're going to develop, defines how we use shared services and how we're all are successful as partners in this watershed. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's what we do. And not just Sylvan Lake, I can, I can give you examples from Lac St. Anne, from Pigeon Lake, where, you know, there's a lot of shared staff and shared CAOs. So it's, um, uh, and then after that, it's, it's a little bit about being penny pinchers and, and, uh, we've got a great uh, volunteer base. Most summer villages have this, these volunteer bases. So you use the, the folks there to perhaps do the maintenance on the beach, perhaps uh, operate your, your beach shelter or picnic area, you know, those sorts of things. We're, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're just a community that really, communities that really know how to come together. You talk about the lake, you talk about the tourism aspect of it, because traditionally when you think of summer villages, and this is in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mike, but traditionally you you would see a higher than average uh, population boom during the summer months because people are going out to the cottage or people are moving out to the lake during the summer months. Um, and then you have the tourism aspect as well. Um well, while municipalities across can, um, Alberta have their own unique economic drivers in it, traditionally summer villages are probably sort of reliant on the tourism industry, correct? Well, um, you know, so we have the ability to uh, provide uh, recreational tourism. What you don't see in a summer village is the services that might go with that. You know, versus like the town of Sylvan Lake, where you've got restaurants and ice cream shops and, you know, all those things that would support that day use um, uh, group of folks. Summer villages, we have parks and we have beaches, but very little of that uh, secondary recreational support. And so people can come out and, and use our beaches and do. I mean, uh, just like anywhere in the province that people want to be close to water when the weather's good. And, and so they come out, but we don't have all the services. So uh, typically, you know, when they come out, they're self-sufficient, they know what, where, what they're coming to and, and provide it. And, and maybe around Sylvan Lake, they use one of the local area beaches, but then they head, head into Sylvan Lake, the town, uh, you know, for a meal or for an ice cream or something else. And, and you know, I, I guess around the province for those municipalities that are not summer villages, but close to Lake, summer villages really help them with their tourism because we provide additional spots outside of their municipality for recreational use. And, and people tend to then head in when they're looking for food and other sorts of things. But what's the major economic drivers for uh, summer villages? Because you can't just solely rely on the tax base of residents, I'm assuming, can you? Well, we do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Best way to yeah. answer a question is just give yeah. me the simple answer. So yeah. You know, I, one of one of the things so that the province looks at when they're checking on the health of municipalities is uh, where does your revenue come from? In summer villages, uh, our revenue, 95% of our revenue comes from the tax base. And the province doesn't think that's very good, but I can tell you, summer villages are going concerns. They're financially responsible, they're viable, they're sustainable. And, and uh, you know, we, we've never been under a viability review. Uh, so we must be doing some things right, even though our revenues all tax based but you you do get grants from the federal and provincial government i'm assuming you have uh, staff members who apply for grants or apply for funding from the municipal from uh, municipal affairs or whatever uh, uh provincial jurisdiction uh 
traditionally they rely on population when they divvy up those results. And I'm going to ask a very political question here, Mike, and I feel like you're up for it, but I'm going to ask it. Do you feel like the kid in the room? Because you have two other municipal organizations, and I know you're part of Alberta municipalities. Uh, they're looking after municipalities as a whole. Then you have RMA, who's looking after the rural municipalities. And then you have yourself, who are looking after the summer villages. Does Do summer villages get their fair share of the pot when it comes to the provincial and federal government, do you find? And I'm, I'm putting you on well, the spot here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the short answer is no. Um, the, the longer answer is, as I said earlier, my passion, my uh, advocacy work uh, that the association and myself have been doing for the last four years is all around getting uh, increasing the amount of infrastructure grants for summer villages. You know, I, I talked about the growth we've seen and where, you know, today, um, you know, 40% of our residents are permanent. 50% of the summer villages are similar in size to a regular village. And, and yet we get, you know, 40 or 50% of the infrastructure funding that other municipalities get. And with the growth that we've seen in the last decade, and, you know, uh, just to throw out some numbers, probably a third of our summer villages in the last decade grew at the Alberta average, you know, so probably growing that 4% or 5% per year. A third of our summer villages grew at twice the Alberta average. And so the growth in those summer villages is similar to the growth that the major centers have seen, Calgary and Edmonton. When, when they talk about 14% growth, we have summer villages that saw that same type of growth. And so when you see that growth, it drives a whole different need uh, for infrastructure, new infrastructure, different types of infrastructure. Our, our folks are looking for wastewater systems, all weather roads, uh, broadband. I mean, we're, we're lucky around Sylvan Lake, as I, I told you before we got into the interview, we've got fiber optic service around Sylvan Lake. But many of the summer villages have very poor, weak broadband matter of fact when we hold our our uh, association meetings and board members are spread out throughout the province many of them struggle to stay connected to our board meeting because there are intranets in and out um and so, so what's the de what's the demographics of summer villages are they are like uh, I, I can imagine they're all different and they're probably uh, a representative of what, of what alberta is but in your time on council for the uh, vill uh, summer village of Half Moon Bay, but also as president of the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta, are you seeing a demographic shift in summer villages, whether whether it used to be uh, part time, potentially even retirees looking just for a nice uh, home to retire? Or are you seeing are, are and then moving into that sort of new families who are just looking for a nice acreage or a place on the water that they can send their kids to school in Sylvan Lake, live out in the country and just have the same just atmosphere as if they were living out in the country, but in a summer village? Yeah, all of the above. You know, I, I would say summer villages uh, look a lot like communities in Calgary, for example. You know, you go through the demographic shift. The population ages, young families move back in, that population ages, young family moves back in. And, and so we have a, a great mix. The one thing that we did see, uh, and pan pandemic related, was the use of these uh, summer homes. Like during the pandemic, our summer village was full, not just in the summer months, but the whole time, and because, and we were lucky, we had great broadband, but we saw it throughout all the summer villages. People, rather than isolating in their primary home, came out to the lake to enjoy the lake. There was some, some freedom out there. There were still rules, obviously, but being uh, an outdoor community, there were, you had the ability to follow those rules and still have uh, uh, a, a bit of a lifestyle. And, and that's carried forward. Man, um, you, you now see uh, people 
exiting large centers and coming to summer villages because they found out during the pandemic that they can maybe electronically commute, uh, you know, sort of thing. And it provided a different lifestyle, something they were looking for. And, and that just goes to demonstrate the growth that we saw in, in the last decade, you know, phenomenal uh, uh, two digit type growth uh, throughout our summer villages. And, and so I'd say there's everything. There's the seniors that we have to look for, look, uh, care for, you know, ensuring that our costs are appropriate. We, we f make sure that rural health issues are cared for, that policing and community safety are top of mind sort of thing. And then we've got the young families that are coming in. The street that I live on here uh, in, in uh, around Sylvan Lake, it's phenomenal. It, it reminds me of when I was uh, a kid growing up here. And, you know, there'd be these pack of kids running up and down the street. They're playing their games, they're in the water, they're throwing baseballs around. We're experiencing that same sort of rebirth here in, in my community. And so I say it's all ages. People have figured out, you know, sometimes it's lifestyle over anything else and, and summer villages can provide that real nice blend. Are the service levels keeping up with the changing demographic, though? Because the, the blend is there. It's great. But uh, I'm assuming traditionally you don't have all the amenities that a big city or a town would have. So how does the how do summer villages put themselves in the mindset of we have to offer things for our residents to do and what while they're here or even keep them here so that way they don't leave and go somewhere else and move? How, how does the service levels of uh, summer villages differ from other municipal jurisdictions? I'd say mostly they're the same, you know, but here's where we go back to that infrastructure grant and, and you know, what we're working on right now, the new uh, era of grants called the Local Government Fiscal Framework, the LGFF. And Wasn't MSI so much easier to understand? <laughs> Well, it, it was, and, and that's where I started, you know, my advocacy work. But here we are moving into this new one. And, and that's key uh, to getting it right for summer villages and why we're, we're pushing so hard to not get everything that a regular village gets or municipality gets, but get a little bit closer because our growth uh, is driving a new need. Uh, and, you know, our residents are are demanding broadband. Like I said, lucky we, we have it. But other summer villages, they're, they're demanding solid broadband. They're looking for wastewater systems for two things. One, for the ease of use. But two, and even more importantly, to uh, protect the lake health. And, and protecting the lake health also protects their investment. But it's also the right thing to do. Um, and, and so that kind of stuff, there are huge dollar projects, like the, the wastewater system that may or may not go in, in our community, uh, 67 lots, $1.5 million sort of thing. And when you divide that, and so we need some government support for things like that. I, another summer village, uh, one of my board members up in the, uh, the uh, Northeast area, just had to replace a bridge into their community. Community of, uh, you know, I think about 130 uh, homes. $2.5 million for a bridge, you know. Another community um, in the Lac St. Anne area had a million dollar uh, two digit road repair, asphalt repair. Uh, so it was a two digit highway that they were responsible for. You know, it's those types of projects that you can't complete on the backs of just who lives here in a summer village. The government provides that infrastructure funding for all other municipalities to a certain level. We would just like to move from somewhere around 50% of what they get to maybe even 75%. And, you know, we'll, you, we'll do the rest with our own source revenue, like we've done in the past. 
So where does the association of summer villages of Alberta come in? Because you have to advocate for all these particular issues as a board. And you you know that the provincial and federal government don't always traditionally just open their wallet and give whatever you want to the, to municipalities. So you have to pick and choose where the advocacy work and the dedication is going to be directed at. How does the association play a role in fostering community, but also fostering the strength that summer villages need when it goes to ask for money from the provincial government when it goes through advocacy work? Yeah, um, yeah, great, great statement. You know, I, I'll just read what our mission statement is. It states that we exist to inspire and support summer villages to achieve strong and effective local government. And, and our tagline that goes along with that is, we're the ACE. So ACE being advocacy, communication, and education. So we've got this three-pronged approach. A solid working board, you know, uh, and, and we all do bits and pieces. Um, some are great at the communication piece. Some are great at the education piece. Uh, our association provides that uh, central spot for perhaps uh, uh, bylaw templates, you know, um, uh, education on aquatic invasive species, you know, those sorts of things. And so we, we provide that support. And then the last one, the advocacy piece, you know, uh, we're, we're all kind of volunteers. And so you're right. We've, we've got to pick the big, the big boulders to push up the hill. And uh, over the years, we've had some great success. We've, we've been able, uh, you know, uh, Minister Nixon was a great supporter of ours. Uh, we, we got the fishing hut regulations changed because um, before we didn't know who was polluting our lakes. Now we do. If, if somebody leaves their fishing hut on uh, with uh, Minister Nixon again, um, we, we were able to figure out boat mooring and dock policies so that uh, Albertans could put docks and boats in the lake, which is crown land, those sorts of things. So we. So I just want to just want to clarify here for a second, because in case people who are listening to this outside oh. of Alberta, uh, Mike is talking about uh, then former Minister of Environment uh, Jason Nixon, who is now Minister of Seniors and House uh, Housing under yeah. Premier Daniel Smith. So just so that yeah. way they're thinking oh. he he's not. Why would he be dealing with fishing? So I just want to give that oh, a little yeah. bit of context. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, and and so. You know, we've been lucky to, to stay connected with the government, um, um, the ASVA, my, my background uh, supports that and where I came from in my career and, uh, and, and everybody that's on the board from ASVA brings all their careers and all that knowledge and we, we apply it together. Um, my strength has been in the government relations, so staying connected and and understanding that so that we can get in front of the government when we have these big issues and and now we're working on the infrastructure grant the lgff uh, and uh, uh, what we hear is that that should close uh, this year at the end of the year and be ready for folks to do their 2024 budgets so uh, the advocacy piece it's hard when uh, we have all all these volunteers we have a part-time executive director and then and then myself and a few others that door knock and send letters and and when we need to we all gather up and stand as one voice and and speak to uh, uh the government on it but um I want to I want to pick up on something you said there, and I want to ask another political okay. question. But again, yeah. I feel like you're up for it. You, you talk about pu pushing the boulder up the hill. Uh, now, there's always stumbling blocks when you're pushing a big giant boulder around advocacy work. In a in a perfect world, what's the one thing that you would want the provincial government to fix tomorrow that would give the summer villages? You talk about LGFF. Is that the biggest stumbling block for you guys right now? Where you'd say. If we got a fair deal from this provincial government around LGFF, even if it is that 75% instead of 50%, that would go a long way in giving summer villages a leg up to go into the future. Uh, absolutely. It's um, it's our number one issue uh, right now. 
it um, it helps with that viability. It helps with providing that service. And and so you know when when you're thinking about some of the challenges we face, I mentioned some of them. You know, broadband, roads and bridges, and wastewater systems, rural health care. Many of that of those issues can be uh, worked on with the right amount of funding uh, from from the government. And it starts with with that program. it's it's it is the the biggest one for us now. Now, I'd say that's a big issue from a government's perspective. You know, if if I was to put another title on it or another request ahead of LGFF is that the government would recognize that summer villages are viable municipalities. The growth that we had is driving different needs. And to support Albertans wanting to move to summer villages or wherever, that that infrastructure grant has to be at the right level to, to help us. Now, Ye- go ahead. Well, and, and, you know, following up on that, it's it's about what we can do to, to maintain lake health. And and there's, you know, a few programs uh, that uh, once this one's done, we'll put our focus towards uh, uh, more work and around lake health. Um, I, I want to talk about the future f- uh, feasibility of summer villages in the province here for a second. And now you have long-term goals, I'm assuming as an association, but also as you as the president. And how how does the how does how does the long-term prospects of summer villages look in the province of Alberta? Oh, I, I'd say we're strong. Um, I, I've used these words a few times, but I, but I do like to use them because I think the more people hear them the more they'll, they'll recognize that summer villages are viable, they're sustainable, they're financially responsible. As I said, you know, there's a viability review process in Alberta for uh, municipalities that are struggling. Summer villages have never been in that viability review process. We always find a way. And when and I go back to what I talked about earlier, where we figured out how to share services how to add value for our partners by contracting from them. They provide services to us. We help them with their revenue stream, all those sorts of things. And, 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 and so I see uh, summer villages uh, continuing. Matter of fact, if, if the government never changed the rule in 1995 that stopped the formation of summer villages, we could easily be double that number in summer villages, I think. There are lots of lakeside communities today that I talk to and say, how do we become a summer village? We like what you're doing. We like that you can control your destiny. We like that you take more uh, interest in managing lake health, water quality, uh, the aquifer, all those things. And we want to be part of that. But you know, uh, they can't. And so they they form a, a more informal association and try to lobby or advocate for certain things with their uh, the counties or the municipal districts that uh, are responsible for them. Now, you're coming up to 65 years as an organization. And then uh, a few weeks after this airs, you will be meeting. And I say you as the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta will be meeting in Edmonton from October 19th to October 20th. Uh, What's on the agenda for this year's uh, Summer Villages, Association of Summer Villages of Alberta conference? Well, there'll definitely be some celebrating that we're 65 years old, that we've that we've made it this far, that we're still a, a great organization that our members find value in. The, the topics that are there, uh, and, and they change from year to year, but uh, let, let me just, there's one on aquatic invasive species, near and dear to us, there's two or three of those. Um, there's code of conduct type stuff where um, the, the councils can understand uh, how better to operate amongst themselves. One of my my favorites, nurse practitioners in rural health care. 
We've got a presentation on that. Can I ask next... about that for a second? Can Do I that. actually ask about that for a second? Because during the uh, last provincial election, I was uh, following along with some of the advocacy work that Alberta municipalities was doing. And I know one of the mayors, and I forget where he's from, and it's going to bother me that I, I I think his name is Ron Griesbeck, if I'm not mistaken, or Griesbeck. Uh, it's, probably... it's actually Ren Griesbeck. Oh. <laughs> and he's he's on the board of the Association of Summer Villages. He is, and he just got acclaimed as the uh, the director for Summer Villages on the board of Alberta Municipalities as well. Yeah. Um, he talked about uh, the need for more nurse practitioners, particularly in rural and remote communities like Summer Villages. Um, we have a new government. I'm going to put you on the hot seat here. Have you heard anything from this new Minister of Health or this Premier or your local MLA who happens to be in Cabinet, you yourself, uh, about having more nurse practitioners uh, sort of work in hospitals outside of the purview of doctors, which which you guys were calling for during the municipal election or right, provincial right. election? Yeah, it's a, it's a great initiative and we're certainly uh, supporting their association. You know what? It, it's been quiet. You know, the, the, the government talks about fixing um, uh, response times and, and ambulances and EMT and those sorts of things and the need to uh, uh, secure more doctors. Uh, I think as they work through those priorities, nurse practitioners will be right in behind there. You know, that is uh, a great alternative to having doctors. And if, if you can... F um, Allow them to work a little bit more independently. Allow them to bill more independently. I think you could see their numbers doubling from, I think they're just under 300 right now. You could see them their numbers quadrupling in the next few years. And, and I think it's a, a great option for Alberta and, and particularly rural Alberta. Getting back to the conference, thank you so much for yeah. answering that. Getting back to the conference, it, it seems like you have a litany of things that uh, summer villages are going to be discussing, uh, and you're only there for two days, the 19th and the 20th. Yeah. Can you get this all done? <laughs> well, absolutely. You know, uh, So one of the things we do, it, it's not that we're going to dive deep into it. It's like a smorgasbord. You, you're going to get 20, 25 minutes. You're going to get the highlights of a topic. One of the topics is about building a climate plan. How can summer villages be more resilient as climate change happens? Um, we're, we're talking about uh, wildfire response and the experiences and how do you prepare for stuff like that? Uh, land use bylaws, which is an important one for us because you can imagine here we are, uh, older summer villages are now going through that rebirth and, and, uh, if you don't have the right land use bylaw, your community will change dramatically and it will no longer may no longer look like what you're looking for. And so you better have the right uh, set of values in place for those land use bylaws. Um, next generation 911, important for rural Alberta. How do, how do, how do we get uh, emergency response out to rural Alberta in, in, in a, uh, a better timeline broadband's on our list again you know for those summer villages and and so it it seems like a reoccurring theme that i i talk about our infrastructure needs uh what our residents are asking for from us the types of services they want us to provide and and here's our conference we're trying to address that now, you, you mentioned something off the top of the uh, in the last 45 minutes that I, I, I let slide because I wanted people to yell at the screen while I say, why did you follow up on this, Chris? But now I'm going to in case they actually stayed for the 45 minutes. Um, you mentioned at the very top, like literally the first statement you said, summer villages, maybe we should change our names because it doesn't traditionally go along with what we are anymore. Is there plans of this happening or is this sort of just a off the cuff joke that I, I'm reading way too much into? You know what? Um, it, it was a bit off the cuff, but, but I actually believe that um, we could change it. And maybe in changing that name changes the government perception of us. 
And in Saskatchewan, they call them resort communities. And so when I think of resort communities, how do I line up against the village of Alberta Beach on Lac St. Anne? How do I line up against Canmore or Jasper? I can tell you Canmore has the same uh, vacancy rate that some of our large summer villages. They Only 80% of their population is permanent. And, and so they struggle uh, providing uh, recreational activities and recreational resources, just like some of our summer villages do. And, and yet they're a much larger municipal, municipal type. Um, so could it be resort villages? Absolutely. Could, could we just be called straight villages? You know, there, as I said, about 50% of our summer villages uh, are similar size to a regular village. They, uh, you know, they just don't have the population to convert. And maybe during the next census, maybe part of our advocacy work is to, uh, in the municipal census, allow uh, temporary residents to be classified as full-time residents. And, and so that's actually my, our next piece of work is to work on that municipal census regulation to try and understand it and, and see how uh, the term temporary residents might be used to benefit summer villages. Wow. Mike, I want to thank you. Um, I feel like we've just scratched the surface, but I have a better understanding of what the issues are you're going through. And hopefully, if I'm uh, able to, I may stop in at the convention this year, your 65th, and see how summer villages celebrate 65 years in uh, service, because I can imagine it's just a good old time with people just enjoying themselves. A, a lot of networking goes on. A lot of questions get answered. So uh, if, if you're in the Edmonton area, please send me a note and <laughs> I'll give you the particulars. Love to have you. Um, Mike, I appreciate you sitting down and doing this today. Greatly appreciate it. Before I let you go, though, I want to ask one last question. Where can people learn more about the summer villages? Because you have 51. I didn't realize there was 51 in the province of Alberta, but here we are. Uh, and how can people learn more about the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta? Oh, perfect. Well, you can visit our website, uh, www.asva.com. And uh, our, our website's there. There's lots of great stories on, on how we became summer villages, our history, what we do. There's a resource center on there, uh, all, all sorts of uh, good things. And uh, you can see our annual reports and some of the things, other things that we're doing as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for this, Mike. I appreciate you interested in summer village. It's been great. That's all for today's episode of Municipal Affairs. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all of those who have tuned in or are listening to today's episode. Your support means the world to us. Now, remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without your help. So please keep those stories coming in. Share your municipal news with us, your concerns, and even your triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, keep talking. Music.